It's a beautiful day in Portland, Oregon for some Pacific Northwest baseball as our midweek matchup pits the Washington Huskies against the hometown Portland Pilots. Welcome to Joe Etzel Field for our game today. I'm Brian Slack, joined by my partner and head coach at Mount Hood Community College, Corey Keir, and we'll have your call. Now the Pilots, they are no strangers to opponents from a larger conference after taking down Texas A&M a couple weekends ago, Corey. But the Huskies, they enter with an eight-game win streak and a record-setting performance at Northern Colorado this past weekend. So what are you excited about in this matchup? Well, what I'm really excited about is we have one of the top teams in the Pac-12 coming in with a 9-2 and two record. I'm really excited about the arm on the mound for them, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the Pilots had a good weekend. They're going to come out and really play some good baseball against a good opponent. Well, on the mound for the Pilots today, hailing from Anchorage, Alaska, is Curtis Hebert as he makes his second appearance in a Pilot uniform, his first start. Has a 27 ERA through 1.1 innings of work, one hit, four earned runs. Had a little bit of trouble with command, three walks and just two strikeouts. But these midweek games are a perfect opportunity to get a chance to see what these young arms can do. Yeah, and, and we've talked about how great Coach Lambert is as a, as a pitching coach and that what a great game game he calls well when you have a, a catcher like Nick Klimp you have great pitch calling it's going to put him in a position to win a ball game let's get you the starting lineup for the Washington Huskies today leading things off it's going to be Cam Clayton the shortstop followed by Will Simpson the first baseman Johnny Tincher the preseason Pac-12 selection is the catcher batting third and the Kobe Morales is in right field batting fourth for the Huskies. A.J. Guerrero in left Michael Snyder and Michael Brown following him Sam DiCarlo the hot freshman will be batting eighth, playing second base, and then McKay Barney out in center field will be batting ninth for the Huskies today. First pitch called a strike. Portland in their white uniforms, pinstripes with the purple P on their left pack. Ground ball hit over to the left side. Ben Pataxel is having trouble with it. Went underneath his glove and then bounced off his ankle, and he couldn't make a clean play on it, so an error to start off this one, and the Huskies have the leadoff man aboard. Yeah, the ball looked like it was, I think what happened there, it looked like the ball was hit a little bit harder than it was. When he realized it was hit soft, he came to attack it, took a little, weird little side spin on him and got off his glove. So now up at the plate is Will Simpson, the first baseman. Simpson, a redshirt junior from Sammamish, Washington, went to Skyline High School, it takes a first pitch strike, 0-1. Through 10 games this season, Simpson's hitting 279, 12 hits in 43 at bats, four home runs, and 10 RBI. There's five different players in the Washington lineup today with double digit RBI. Ebert peeks over his shoulder, comes home with it, fouled off into the netting to our right behind home plate. 0 and 2 on Simpson. Hit into left field, and it'll land right in front of Briley Knight. So the first two batters are aboard for Washington to start off this midweek matchup. So Johnny Tincher is now up at the plate. Preseason all Pac-12 selection. The only one for the Huskies so far this season. Huskies were selected to finish seventh in the Pac-12 this year, but off to a hot start. Corey, as you mentioned, nine and two already this season. They're on an eight-game win streak as Tincher takes a strike to start off this at bat, 0-1. Yeah, already liking what Herbert what Herbert's been able to do. Uh, you know, he gets the air, comes right back, gets 0-2. Here we are after a little blooper job off the end of the bat, right back into the strike zone for strike one. Really responding to to the ne uh, to the negatives. Hebert, excuse me. Tincher takes one low for a ball. Tincher Redshirt Jr. from California. Played in all 11 games so far this season with 15 hits. The 1-1 one -one slider at the top of the zone for a strike, 1-2. and two. Defensively, this is what it looks like for the Pilots. Briley Knight out in the left, Jay Colcroft in center, and Henry Mench getting the start in right. Spencer Scott at third, Ben Pataxel at short. Jonas Salk gets the start at second. Then Zach Tolia is the first baseman for the Pilots today. Nick Klemp, the grad student, 
Manning behind the plate. As Hebert missing low and away, makes it a two and two count. Skied in the air, this one should stay in the infield. Spencer Scott is getting underneath it and he'll make the catch over his left shoulder. So the first out retired for the Huskies here in the first inning. And that'll bring up A.J. Guerrero. Little infield fly, coach's favorite thing in that situation. No outs first and second, a little infield fly. Don't even have to catch the dang thing. So A.J. Guerrero stepping to the plate, the juniors batting or excuse me, Kobe Morales is stepping to the plate. He's batting 308 on the season. Morales takes a fastball just above the knees, far side of the plate, starts him out 0-1. And that's what I've, I've really liked seeing in this brief time. Hebert, each batter he started out with a quick strike, if not two. The 0-1. Bouncing this one in the dirt, it's blocked by Clemp. That'll even the count at one and one. Yeah, like every other arm that's come out of uh, the Portland Penn this year that I've watched, just uh, showing a lot of maturity no matter how old they are. You know, we saw Siegel this weekend, saw another young guy come out, show a Zach lot of maturity. Johnson, yeah. Zach Johnson, yeah, and, and, and now Hebert. The one one. Patience by Morales at the plate as he lays off the off speed, two and one. Morales, a junior from Downey, California, went to Cypress College before finding a home at the University of Washington. Went to St. John Bosco. Slider from Hebert, unable to find the zone on the back end, three and one. Right side of the infield playing back. Jonas Salk, the second baseman in shallow right field as that slider missing low and away. And now the bases are loaded. You've got an error, a single, and a walk to load them up. And now that'll bring up the left fielder, A.J. Guerrero. Guerrero just a sophomore from Fife, Washington. Well, and you, never, you don't really want to panic in this situation because the arm on the mound has been throwing the ball in the strike zone and really one pitch away, a ball to, pa to a Pataxel, and you got a two ball and you're out of it, so. Well, responds after the walk with a first pitch strike to Guerrero. Guerrero started all 56 games last season as a freshman hitting 299. 14 doubles, 10 home runs. Both of them were second on the team along with his 42 RBI. He actually finished last season on a 14-game hit streak. Takes a ball. That'll even the count at one and one. Cam Clayton stands at third after he got on on an error from Ben Pataxel. Will Simpson is at second after he singled. Slider off the plate in the left-handed batter's box, and now that puts Guerrero ahead in the count, two and one. Wind at Toliani steps on the bag at first, more like he puts the glove on the bag at first, but doubles up the Huskies. And no runs come in to score after the double play by Tolia. So three left stranded. It's a 0-0 ball game as we head to the bottom of the first inning. Holcroft, Klemp, and Cooney coming to the plate first for the Pilots. Another look at Tolia's play.
Welcome back to Joe Edso Field. Brian Slyke and Corey here with your call. On the mound today for the Washington Huskies, it's a left-handed pitcher named Sam Boyle from Vancouver, Washington, uh, from a little high school called Columbia River Quarry. I'm sure you're quite familiar with that one. On the season, 3-3-8 ERA, 1-0 record through five appearances. Eight innings of work. He's given up nine hits, three earned runs, ten strikeouts to just two walks, and opponents are hitting 281 against him on the season. Now, I mentioned that part about Corey, because Corey, you happen to coach at Columbia River. You're very familiar with Sam Boyle on the mound and how special of a talent that he is. Yeah, he's a special young man. And, you know, when he was a freshman and he was, uh, you know, we had a preseason workout and uh, we saw we saw this gangly left-hander come in. And uh, there was a couple of kids in that class that were pretty good. And matter of fact, there's a different another Columbia River kid on this team uh, named Sawyer Parkin. Uh, but when he uh, when he came into the gym and played catch, I told Donald that, hey, man, this guy's got to be on our staff this year. And when he was a freshman, he was a starter for us. Holcroft fouls off that pitch, so one and one count to him. Sort of a shift put on right now with Holcroft at the plate as he gets an inside pitch, check swing down to the third base umpire, Garrett Wilson. He did not go around. Here's the lineup for the Pilots. Holcroft leading off, Clemp batting second, Christian Cooney, the DH, batting third, Briley Knight cleanup out in the left, Spencer Scott third, batting fifth, Henry Mensch out in right, Ben Pataxel will be batting seventh. He's over at short, Talia at first, batting eighth, and then Jonas Salk, the freshman, will be batting ninth at second base. Holcroft fouled off the last pitch, so two and two now. Puts this one out in the right field, and it's going to drop right in front of the right fielder, Kobe Morales. It's going to bounce all the way to the wall. Holcroft has his wheels going. He rounds second. He's headed into third, and that's where he will end up. Lead off triple for Holcroft after Morales misplays the dive. Seemed like he didn't have a good beat off of it initially off the bat of Holcroft there, Corey. Yeah, it was a changeup that was a little bit up. Uh, Holcroft caught it out front hit off the end of the bat. Now, in that situation, I'm just going to tell you, if you're an outfielder, you either catch that ball or keep it in front, especially early in the ball game like this. You keep that ball in front, you got a guy on first base, and you wiggle out of a wiggle out of a, out of of a a jam. With Holcroft on third, 13 ways to score. Klemp doesn't have to do much here to get a run on the board for the Pilots. Infield brought in for the Huskies. Klemp gets one off the end of the bat. I believe it's a high chopper over to first. Boyle go to to step on first and he will beat Clemp as he covered the bag and so they get that first out of the inning Holcroft stayed put at third with the infield chopper actually a, a, a pretty dang athletic play yeah. by Sam that's a tough deal there you know he's working his way off the mound there uh, and continued on and 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 Clemp can run a little bit there's a lot of scouts in the park here video and him and in, uh, in pregame in his batting practice but he runs the heck out of it too there's a defense for Washington, Guerrero, Barney, and Morales in the outfield from left to right. Snyder, Clayton, DiCarlo, Simpson, and Tincher behind the plate. First pitch to Christian Cooney called a strike. So 0-1 to start off this at-bat. Now Portland in their pinstripe uniforms. Portland P on the left pack. The Huskies are in their gray uniforms. Washington in script across the chest in purple. With gray pants, no sutash for them. Cooney, big swing and a miss on that off speed. One and two. So can the Pilots capitalize on the leadoff triple from Jake Holcroft? Cooney goes down with a strikeout. Yeah, you can see it right there. You know, uh, from an early age, Sam has been able to throw the changeup. You know, when he was a freshman, he was kind of a two-pitch guy developing the breaking ball. Uh, he has so much movement on his fastball alone. I mean, there you see right there. Uh, that looked like a fastball yeah. to me. I didn't actually see what it was, but uh, a ton of movement. You know, when he was a, when he was young, we put the catcher right over the middle and we just threw the ball at the catcher, like almost like he was a knuckleball pitcher. pitcher and uh, the movement took care of itself. And then as he got older and developed his pitches, you know, by the time he was a senior, now I didn't coach him as a senior, but he, uh, he, him and a couple guys single-handedly took a team all the way to the state finals, lost in the final inning of it. And, you know, his stats as a senior are just ridiculous. He had 62 innings. He, he, won, he won 10 games. He had 119 strikeouts. 
You're talking about two strikeouts per inning almost. Seven walks, seven walks, which is incredible. Uh, and then five earned runs with a .56 ERA. I would argue probably one of the best high school stats in the history of Washington. Now, I know there's someone out there that will say there's someone better, but pretty promising for Sam to keep playing at, uh, at a higher and higher level. So, And he's really developed the breaking ball, too. Yeah, we've seen it a couple of times here already in this one as Knight fouls off the ball in front of the Washington dugout. So one and two. And this would be a great opportunity for Boyle facing some adversity with that leadoff triple and gets back-to-back -back outs, a chance to get three straight as it's a ground ball hit to the right side. Played by the shortstop Cam Clayton on the shift. And they will get out of the inning unscathed. Pilots strand the runner over at third and Holcroft after the leadoff triple. It's 0-0 as we head to the second inning. Michael Snyder, Michael Brown, and Sam DiCarlo coming to the plate for the Huskies when we return. Welcome back to the Ets for the top of the second inning. Brian Slyke and Corey Keir with your call. Michael Snyder, the third baseman for the Huskies, steps to the plate. Snyder, a redshirt junior from Woodland Hills, California. On the season so far, he's hitting 214, played in all 11 games with nine hits so far. Takes a first pitch ball inside and high, 1-0. Yeah. Talk about some presence out of two freshman pitchers. I mean, the pilot's pitcher, obviously, Hebert. He gets the bases loaded, pitches out of it. You know, uh, Boyle gets a, a leadoff kind of – it's probably a triple. I don't think it's an error. They are calling it an yeah, error. Yeah, they called it – no, they called it a triple. It was an error on Patax on the first inning that you're looking at. It's this one's popped up on the left side, caught by Spencer Scott. Yeah. And first one's away. Yeah, leadoff triple, and then, and then proceeds to work through, you know, three of the most quality hitters yeah. that Portland's going to run out there. So uh, pretty awesome to see Young Bucks out on the mound performing like that. Now up to the plate is Michael Brown. The junior is only playing in his fifth game so far this season. First pitch ball. It'll be 1-0. Brown, a junior from Vacaville, California. Standing at 6'5", 245. Got a chance to stand by the dugout down there and watch Brown swing the bat and BP, and there's a little bit of power in this bat. Mm -hmm. Sophomore, he played 21 games with 12 starts, hitting 205. Two and one count after that ball. And his dad, Michael, had a 10-year career with Pittsburgh Pirates organization. Comes from a baseball background. Here's the 2-1 from Hebert. Hit out in the left field. Briley Knight coming from his position. Coming in, and he will make the catch over his shoulder for the second out. Two away here in the second inning. Sam DeCarlo, the second baseman. Freshman from Long Beach, California, has made a name for himself early on in a Huskies uniform. So he's hitting 375 through 11 games with 12 hits and 11 RBI. In fact, half of his hits have gone for extra bases, Corey. Five doubles and one home run. So he fouls this one back into the netting. 0-1. Oh Leads the Huskies in average so far this year, batting 375. 
currently on a five game hit streak. The 0 1. Swung on and missed. 0 and 2 on DeCarlo. He sports kind of an interesting setup. He's got a, I'm not going to say it's an exact setup, but he's got a little Paul Molitor in him. If you watch him, it's really stoic. There's not a lot of rhythm, just kind of ready to go. As this one gets away from Clem. First ball, one and two. I know you know Paul Molitor, but you're a young buck. A lot of guys probably don't know who Paul Molitor is. But Let uh, him know, yeah. yeah. The one, two. Jack Swing went around. That's a strikeout and a 1-2-3 inning for the freshman on the mound. As the Huskies go back to the dugout, we'll come back out for the bottom of the second inning. Spencer Scott, Henry Mench, and Ben Pataxel all come to the plate for the Pilots when we return. Bottom of the second inning here at Joe Edsel Field on the campus of the University of Portland. Brian Slyke and Corey Keir with your call. Pilots looking to draw first blood as Spencer Scott is up at the plate. Takes the first pitch strike from Sam Boyle on the mound. Foul ball down the right field line and into the grassy berm area. 0-2 on Scott. Scott, a couple weekends ago, was the WCC Player of the Week after helping the Pilots take the series against number five, Texas A&M, down at College Station. Takes the ball one and two. And we saw a lot of veteran guys in the lineup last year, like we've seen the last couple years, but Scott really showed something to this coaching staff, and he found his way into the lineup 27 different times as he takes a strike out there looking. Henry Mench now comes to the plate. Mench, a junior from Seattle, Washington. O'Day High School, as you see that last pitch from Boyle. Great location, man. Yeah. Kind of started off his hip and it ran back over the plate. And... Mench starts off with a strike 0 and 1. Mench playing in his seventh game this season. He's got six hits and 14 at bats, hitting 429. He has one home run, which has driven in his only run so far this season. Check swing, they appeal down to Jim Courtney, the first base umpire. He did not go around, one and one. 47 degrees today on the bluff, mostly cloudy. Four mile an hour winds. They're blowing from left to right. It's Mench. Empty on that swing, one and two. And now they've got their defense set up for Mench to pull the ball. As he fouls this off into the netting, we'll reset at the 1-2 count. Left side of the infield playing back. DeCarlo, the second baseman, almost playing directly behind the bag at second. You see on your screen right there. Then the first baseman, Simpson, off the line. 15 feet. The 
inside on Mench. Just got his hip out of the way of that one, two and two. Mench goes down on strikes. Third strikeout on the day for Boyle. Second one this inning. Yeah, the combo, the effective velocity between his changeup and his fastball is really ridiculous today. I mean, he's throwing the heck out of the fastball with a little extra effort than I've seen him in the past. Uh, and the changeup's working. So, you know, you get that, that, velo or that velocity fastball uh, away as a certain... Go ahead. Pataxo hits a fly ball out near the gap. The center fielder, McKay Barney, will make the catch. He'll pick up that thought when we return for the top of the third inning. Due up for the Huskies, it's McKay Barney, the man who just made that catch with Cam Clayton and Will Simpson. All due up for the Huskies when we return on the WCC Network. Welcome back onto the campus of the University of Portland. Brian Slyke and Corey Keir with your call between Washington and the University of Portland. 0-0 ball game, top of the third inning. McKay Barney, first pitch he sees, sends it out into left field, and an easy catch for Briley Knight to start off the bottom of the third inning. And it seems like Washington just trying to jump early on the freshman arm of Portland. And they had some minor success in that first inning, but so far Hebert has sort of neutralized that. Yeah, mixes his pitches up well, which, like I said, we've talked before, the pitch calling out of the dugout. And he lands them, and that's the important thing. And a rare first pitch ball to Cam Clayton. Clayton reached on an error his last time up. He's hitting 265 on the season. Slider just missing inside there, stayed high. It'll be 2-0. and oh. Sophomore from Lake Oswego, Oregon, went to Lake Ridge High School. The 2-0. -oh. Ebert finding the strike zone at the knees. Strike two called on Clayton inside part of the plate. So two and two now for Hebert on the mound to Cam Clayton. Clayton with 13 hits to go along with his 13 RBI. Fouls this one off behind us. We'll reset at the 2-2 count. Yeah, we were talking about effective velocity and, and how it plays. And, you know, you get a kid like... Uh, like Sam Boyle that, that throws a, you know, let's say it's 86, 87, but if it's 87 at the belt in, you know, it's going to play like 90 because you got to get your barrel out front to get it. And then he throws a 75 mile an hour changeup that's, uh, that's down and away that's going to play like 69. And the effective okay, velocity yeah. difference and the eye change and stuff like that. So when you have the ability to move pitches around the strike zone and change speeds, uh, you can really be effective. Full 
Full count now on Clayton as he has a chance to work himself on with a walk. Three, two. Hung a slider, hit up high into left field, but again, Briley Knight in the right spot as he's tracking that one. He makes the catch and two away to start off this third inning. Will Simpson singled in his last time up. Takes a first pitch strike from Hebert. So he'll start out quickly behind 0-1. Defense playing back, not much movement from them. Slider missing inside. It'll be one and one. Now, Hebert comes from Anchorage, Alaska. Corey, can you name me? Starting pitcher that was born in Anchorage, Alaska. Two-time World Series champion. Once in the NL, once in the AL. And I don't want to give you too many clues because it'll give it away pretty fast. This gentleman was a part of the world champion Diamondbacks. Schilling? My man. Yeah, Kurt Schilling was born in Anchorage, Alaska. Go ahead and mark a tally up there for you. One for Corey. 2-2, <laughs> two, two, strike three called on Simpson. And Hebert having a day on the mound as he gets through three innings. Another 1-2-3 spot for him as we head to the bottom of the third. That's the bottom of the lineup for the Pilots. Tolia, Salk, and then back to the top to Holcroft when we return on the WCC Network. There's a look at the eighth year head coach for the Portland Pilots, Jeff Loomis, and he's done a great job at turning this program around in his time here on the bluff. First pitch to Zach Tolia, takes a strike inside 0-1, but uh, can't say enough about the culture that he has set here on the bluff, not only once as a player, but turning that into the head coaching job and really setting up this team for success as Tolia takes strike two, 0 and 2. Yeah, what I like about a Loomis club is number one, there's very high baseball intelligence. Everybody on the ball, on the ball field is playing chess, not checkers. Uh, the other thing is they play for each other, which, uh, which I really like. There's not a lot of individuals out there that are playing for themselves. As Tolia goes down with a strikeout, it'll be Jonas Salk, the freshman from Fairfax, California, that'll step to the plate. Another look at that strikeout from Boyle. That's his fourth strikeout on the day. So you're talking about a high baseball IQ, though, for this team. It just seems like everybody that we talk to is constantly on top of what the situation is, how they should approach it, and, and that just goes all back to this coaching staff here at Portland. Yeah, I mean, again, and, you know, well, we've talked about Loomis and we've talked about Lam uh, uh, Lambert, but, you know, there's a guy on, on staff named Trey Watt, and Trey Watt is as good as it gets when it comes to baseball. Uh, and uh, they really coach it up. 
you know, and they've done it for a consistent amount of years. And you can see the maturity in the players. You know, Coach Loomis is not a high emotion or a up and down guy. He's a real stoic, kind of middle of the road guy. A little fiery at times, oh, yeah. if you will. <laughs> Seen him be a little fiery in the third base box. We didn't get to see that last year because he wasn't out in the third base box because Valentine was there. But uh, we've seen him be a little fiery, and I like that about him. But uh, but it's just, uh, you know, a high focus, medium intensity ball club. The one two to Salk. Fouls this one off just enough. So we'll go back to the one two count. Saul hitting 333 in the young season, two hits and six at bats. But those two hits are big a double and a home run. He's got two RBI on the season as well. Lays off the low pitch. It's been called a strike a couple times, I, I think, throughout this game. So good patience by him. Two and two. Yeah, behind the uh, dish, uh, Todd Ellis, a longtime umpire. And now we're hearing some words from the Washington dugout. And Todd Ellis is not having any of it. I think he just gave them a warning. Can't see Todd Ellis right now. There's a look inside of the Washington dugout. Now, we couldn't hear any chirping up here, but clearly... Todd heard it, and he was having none of it. You know, Todd, uh, Todd is a local guy, you know, uh, uh, out in the uh, Beaverton area. His daughter attended Westview. Uh, he umpired, like, he, he cut his teeth about the time I cut my teeth coaching, which has been a long time ago. And, uh, you know, I remember when he was a high school umpire out there, and then he went on and did junior college ball, and then he went to the West Coast League, and, you know, now he's in the uh, West Coast Conference. Uh, umpiring squad and strike three this time it's looking for Salk and the fifth strikeout now for Boyle one in the first two in the second two in the third as Holcroft comes to the plate he's the only man that's gotten the best of Boyle so far with a leadoff triple in the first another look at it here yeah, the two-seam fastball today that Sam's throwing, and it might even be four-seam because of the movement on it, but he's really hitting his spots today. Holcroft hits it over to first, and Simpson plays it himself. Boyle slipped coming off the mound, but he's able to step on the bag. As Simpson gets Holcroft out, a 1-2-3 inning for the Pilots. We head to the fourth. Tincher, Morales, and Guerrero all do up for the Huskies on the WCC Network. Top of the fourth inning at Joe Edsel Field as the clouds are rolling in here. We do have a chance of some sprinkles. Curtis Hebert back out on the mound for a fourth inning of work. Delivers a first pitch strike to Johnny Tincher. Yeah, it's kind of crazy what a small world it is. You know, uh, Jim Courtney out there, you know, he started out as a local high school umpire and, and uh, you know, has really elevated him himself in the umpiring world as well. Tincher grounds out to Pataxel. But that's sort of, you know, putting in your dues, basically. Starting out at that high school level, then you go up to the West Coast League sort of type thing, and then you're, you know, next thing you know, you're, you're coaching, or not coaching, excuse me, umpiring these games here mm -hmm. in the West Coast Conference. 
Yeah, and all three umpires on the field are good umpires. Todd Ellis is a great umpire, and and uh, you know he's going to miss some calls, uh, just like players make errors. But uh, but yeah, that's part of the human element of this game, though. We talked about that, you know, and the nice piece about uh, about it is they're part of the reality TV show that is baseball. You know, uh, I actually had a chance to chat it up with Trey Watt, and we were talking about that before the game about uh, artificial intelligent, you know, strike zones and. You know, the higher the level go, uh, goes, the easier it is for the hitters, the highest level hitters, because they really know where the strike zone is, where the lower you go, the less you know the strike uh, the strike zone. So you have to, you know, you have to kind of make an adjustment to the umpire rather than to the strike zone. That ball sliced foul on top of the Pianovi hitting facility. So two and one on Kobe Morales, who has a walk so far back in the first inning. Now you're talking about umpires, Corey, back in 1979 on this date. The exhibition season for MLB started with semi-pro umpires and amateur umpires because of the umpire strike that happened in 1979. Here's the 2-1. Morales fouls it off, evens the count at 2-2. Two and two. Here's the 2-2, Salk, his feet are in shallow right field. This one spiked into the dirt just in front of Clem, full count now on Morales, 3-2. Yeah, to expand on the umpire thing, you know, another uh, great Columbia River chieftain that was coached by Stephen Donahue over there was uh, a guy named Alex McGarry, who's just killing it in the Cincinnati Red organization. Morales puts one into left field. Knight will cut it off, comes up throwing quickly, and that'll limit that hit to just a single for Morales. The second hit of the day for the Huskies, and that'll bring up A.J. Guerrero. And where I was going with that, I was talking to Alex about, about his tran uh, going from double-A AA to triple-A, and he was talking about how much he loved the umpiring as he climbed. He felt like he was a better hitter the higher level he went because he understood the strike zone better, and he could pick the pitches that he wanted to hit rather than having to expand the strike zone at the lower level. So uh, I can understand why some of the high-level hitters want to use artificial intelligence so that way they'll know exactly where the strike zone is. But it makes a little sense to me. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people realize that as major league players are making their way up to the majors, that's the same thing that those umpires are doing. They're starting out in single A, and they get graded every single game. This ball gets hit out in the right field. This one might be at the track. Mench is there, and no. Bounces off the wall. Both outfielders go down for Portland, and that will be a double for A.J. Guerrero. Moving over to third is Kobe Morales. And now there's two aboard with one out and Michael Snyder coming to the plate. And that was a difficult play in the outfield. Yeah, it's interesting play. I think that they were trying to communicate there and both of them didn't know if either of them was going to catch the baseball. Mench kind of shut it down a little bit early because I think Mench thought it might have been out or it was going to go off the wall. Uh, That's a difficult play. Man, Holcroft came a long yes, ways to get that baseball. I mean, uh, really... Uh, I mean, you look at... at I know the viewers can't see right now, but you look at where Mench is and where Holcroft is, that's about where they came from. See the P in pilots out in right field, that's where Mench is, Holcroft is in deep center, and that ball hit off the O in home. Check swing here by Snyder, goes foul. So yeah. he'll start out 0-1. I mean, if you, uh, I mean if, you, if you have a question on how well Holcroft runs, just watch that yeah. play. I mean, he come out of nowhere, to be honest with you. Off the bat, I thought the ball might be caught by Mench. It carried way farther than mm -hmm. it was, and out of nowhere, here comes Holcroft from a, you know, he was shaded, but it was, but he came a long yeah, ways, man. He did. This one in the dirt, Clemp gloves it one and one. Here's another look at that last hit by Guerrero. And you see how far Holcroft is coming there. And, and you see that stop by Mench. It, it seemed like Mench probably could have made that play, but it, he made the assessment that it might go off the wall or go over. Yeah, I actually think he played that perfectly. I think he got back to where he thought it was going to either hit the wall or go over the wall uh -huh. and was going to play the carom, yeah. if you will. Uh, and it ended up lower on the fence probably than he expected. Now, if he would have ran to get it, maybe he could have got it, but yeah. I, I feel like... Uh, he was being conservative with it, making sure that the ball wouldn't get away from it if it went off the wall. Yeah, it was a tweener, and 
And, and I think if you ask him after the game, he's going to say, man, I thought that ball was going out of here, but it, or it was going to hit the top of the fence, yeah. and it just got a little bit lower. But uh -huh. uh, the ball definitely carried. You know, the wind's not blowing today like it was blowing this weekend. And, uh, yeah. 1-2 to Snyder missing low. 2-2. Two and two. And the one thing about the pilots is you got three center fielders out yeah. there right now. I mean, all, all three of them can play center field. Mench has played center field. So it's not like there's a lack of skill level out there anywhere. Infield being pulled in now. Was just the corner infielders. Now everybody's drawn in. The 2-2 two -two to Snyder. Popped up. This is shallow center field. Pataxel turned his back to the infield, and he can't make the catch just off the edge of his glove. Mench will come up and throw it in. And one run will come in. The Huskies take a 1-0 lead here in the fourth. And that was a difficult play for Pataxel. They're going to mark that one down as a hit as they should, but with him being drawn in and having to turn his back to the plate and make a play over his shoulder, that's a tough one to do. Yeah, super unlucky really there for the Pilots. They were playing back. They were playing back, and they brought him in, and they brought him in because there was two strikes. And, you know, uh, most hitters shorten up with two strikes and figured he might hit a ground ball. And, and uh, quite frankly, that's probably an infield fly if they're playing back. I mean, that was, what, uh, four, eight, five, six, seven feet? Yeah, maybe. Him, you know, they get camped. It's supposed to be on the dirt, but a lot of times that'll be called an infield fly. P pretty unlucky for the pilots there. Michael Brown now at the plate. Brown flew out to Briley Knight his last time up. And now Nick Klemp is going to call time to go out to the mound and talk things over with the freshman pitcher. And, and maybe not an infield fly, maybe just a flat catch ball. I mean, yeah. I, I feel that there's no doubt the second baseman shortstop catches that, no run scores. Yeah, I think you're right there. Maybe not the infield fly, yeah. but, but where they are back there, it would have been an easier play for him to try to make that catch instead of running all the way out there from being pulled in. As you saw briefly, Ty Saunders is in the bullpen warming up right now for Portland. Saunders, a utility infielder for Portland. Regular starter on the middle infielder last season. Man, he's a little bit of a Superman. Like he swings from the left side, he swings from the right side, he plays three positions. I've se I think he played outfield one time last year. I might be wrong. And now <laughs> he's going to come out and pitch. He's a little bit of a utility guy, I'd say. Brown fouls off the second pitch. One and one to him. It seems like a lot of these players on Portland's roster, the ability to just play multiple positions really has to free things up for Coach Loomis and his ability to set that lineup, knowing that he can trust three or four different players to man each position. Hebert just missing low and away on that one. Two and one now to Brown. Guerrero's on second, Snyder's on first after that RBI single. Brown takes another one off the far side of the plate and sends it foul to our left. Two and two. As we have a dark cloud just hanging over Joe Edsel Field right now, we might start to see some rain, which has been a staple on the home games this season. Brown, no chase on the low fastball. Full count now. For the man from Vacaville, California. Brown only playing in his fifth game. Three hits and six at-bats. That was coming into today. Already 0 for 1. Here's the full count. Runners on first and second. Ebert throws back to second. Pataxel's there. No tag applied. We'll reset on the full count. If you get a ground ball, you can get out of this inning with a possible double play. Limit that damage to only one run. Hebert's been trying to pepper the outside part of the plate against Brown. He does again here and is fouled off to our left. 3-2. Hebert closing in on 60 pitches. Go! 
And missing low and away, Brown works himself on with a walk, and now the bases are loaded again for Hebert. And that'll bring up Sam DeCarlo, who struck out back in the second. But as a true freshman, he has done damage at the plate, and now we're going to have a mound visit. Coach Lambert is going to go out onto the rubber. Seems like Ty Saunders is ready to go. And that is it. They're going to make a pitching change. So Curtis Hebert's day is done as they make a call to the bullpen. We're going to take a quick break here on the WCC Network. Pilots trailing 1-0 in the top of the fourth. Bases are loaded for the Huskies with only one out. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Joe Edsel Field. Top of the fourth inning right now. New pitcher on the mound is Ty Saunders for the Pilots. Saunders has pitched in one other game so far this season. Got through two-thirds of an inning, giving up one hit, two runs. One of those was earned with two strikeouts and two walks. So limited action for him. Now, Corey, you and I have never seen him on the mound uh, in our time calling games on the bluff. So this is a first for us as he goes up against the freshman Sam DiCarlo. Corner infielders playing in for Portland. Tolia and Scott. Toes on the infield grass as DiCarlo takes a ball one away and high, one and one. I remember when I was young and was a big time Mariner fan, they always had these ad campaigns with these different players and I think there was an ad campaign. I remember the Ichiro and Ichiro was doing everything in the ballpark and uh, uh, you know he was the ticket guy, he was the hot dog guy, you know, he played the outfield, he pitched and I'm, I'm what Saunders going to do next? Going to go <laughs> sell some tickets down there. I mean, he's played a lot of different positions for the for the pilots, and uh, he's got a great arm. And I love that Lambert's putting him in this situation. It looks like they're going to use him in the pen this year. Well, it gives him another opportunity to get on the field too, with how competitive this dugout is and getting playing time. Well, you take a guy like Saunders who is a plus defender and a great arm, put him on the mound, you can utilize him. And in situations like this, you know he's going to field his position, that's for sure. 
And he walks to Carlo and a run will come in. That's Guerrero that scores off of that walk. And that'll bring up the center fielder, McKay Barney. Snyder moves over to third. Brown moves up to second after that walk. So the Pilots, since getting that first down, it's been a single, double, single, and two walks. First pitch strike to Barney. It'll be 0-1. He's 0-for-1 today with a fly out to Briley Knight back in the third inning. You know, Saunders is a junior, and there, you know, there's another guy that played a position before he pitched, and uh, by the time he got out of here, he was pretty special, wasn't he? Yeah, only the WCC Pitcher of the Year last year in Brett Gillis. Ninth round draft pick by the Houston Astros. The 1-1. One, one. At the knees in there, part of the plate. One and two. Corner infielder still brought in for the Pilots. Trying to minimize the damage. Barney swings that one into the glove of Clemp, and that's a strikeout, two away. Great pitch there. Looked like a changeup to me, yep. actually. Had a little depth to it. Second look at it. Oh, yeah. Good little changeup. Barney just ran out of bat. Right there, Cam Coyton at the plate. 0 for 2 today, reached on an error in the first, and then he flew out to Briley Knight his last time up. Saunders delivering a first pitch strike, 0 and 1. You know, one of the things I like about this too, it's not like Saunders never played in a big game or yep. been in a pilot's uniform, and you know, this transition from going from there to there to there, now here, uh, zero fear to be in this ball game. And that was a pretty good little break. Yes, ball it was. Just, well, I mean, we like I said, he's got a great arm, and when you got a hand speed uh, and you got confidence, you can pitch, and I, no doubt he was a pitcher on his high school team, no doubt. Saunders from Anacortes, Washington. The 0-2, low and away, no chase from Clayton. That'll make it one and two. Pulled over to the top of the lineup here in the top of the fourth. Third time that Clayton has been up. This one's golfed and slicing over towards the cars to our right. It actually goes off of a tree and back onto the grassy berm. We'll reset to the one-two. You know, the weather's been a little better. I saw that ball bounce on the berm and it used to plug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that snow bank over there is getting a little smaller, smaller too. Smaller and smaller, yep. It'll be about June and the snow will be gone. The one-two, breaking ball stayed high and inside on Clayton, evens the count at two and two. It's not often you see sitting snow for this long here in Portland. Two two with two outs. Fouled back and out of play. Clayton hanging tough in this at bat, trying to add on a couple of insurance runs right now for Washington. They've already pushed two across in this inning. An RBI single by Michael Snyder, then the RBI walk, thanks to Sam DiCarlo. Those are the two runs so far. 2-2. Two -two. Foul back again. Clayton doing a good job spoiling pitches from Saunders. Will Simpson, the first baseman's on deck. He has one of the four hits so far for Washington. Another one sent towards the grassy berm area. And just on the other side of the fence and into an empty parking spot. So back to the 2-2. You know, at some point, uh, Saunders is going to pull the pull the string. Oh, yeah. We already saw it a couple. Or, or, or throw the slider. Just threw a beauty of a breaking ball to the last batter. I think he almost pulled it off right there, but Clayton got enough of it off the cap of the bat. See, this is a time, me as a pitch caller, I like to use shake in this situation. He's throwing multiple fastballs in a row, and it's a great time to 
saying, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. create doubt, create a little doubt. Yeah, create a little doubt, and then the hitter gets to thinking, and then you can go ahead and use a velocity fastball. Fouled off again. Infield back to their normal depth with the 2-2 two -two and two outs. Breaking ball gets Clayton. They strand three. But two runs come in to score, and the Huskies take a 2-0 lead here in the fourth. As we head to the bottom of the fourth, Clemp, Cooney, and Knight all come to the plate for their second at-bats for the Pilots when we return on the WCC Network. Welcome back to Joe Edsel Field, bottom of the fourth inning. As Sam Boyle comes out for a fourth inning of work for the Huskies, he's done a great job so far on the mound. Five strikeouts, no walks, and his only hit is a triple that probably could have been prevented a, a single had it been played a little bit differently. But he's just done a terrific job. Commanding the strike zone, mixing up his pitches as it's now 2-0 on Klemp. But, Corey, you, you and I were just talking at the break that, hey, that was a long inning for Portland out in the field. How is Boyle going to respond after cooling off a little bit in that dugout? Yeah, I think it's something as a pitching coach that you try to be aware of. Some guys, it's just no issue. They they have no problem with it. And some guys need to go back out to the pen when the, you know, when the pitching change happened. There was only one out. A lot of times they'll run a guy back out in the pen just to keep him tuned up. Klemp lays off of one of the left-handed batter's box, 3-1. And ball four thrown to Clamp, so the leadoff man is aboard for Portland. And that's exactly what they'd won after losing the top half of this inning. And, Corey, you always talk about winning innings. We saw them do that exactly against Utah Valley in the series finale on Sunday when they dropped three in the top of the six but responded with four in the bottom of the six to win that inning and, and give themselves the lead. And it's the reason they won the game. Yep. I mean, they gave up three and then came back and got four and, and kept out front of Utah Valley. And Utah Valley played really tough this yeah. weekend against them. Yeah, that's a program that steadily on the rise right now under second-year head coach Eddie Smith. Guy that you've known for a while and familiar with this part of the country as the former coach of Lower Columbia. Yeah, he's put himself, he put a pretty nice career together. Won some titles there at Lower Columbia and, you know, went off and pitch, uh, coached at LSU and Tulane and and now he's the head coach over at uh, Utah Valley, and he's a heck of a recruiter, and, a, and he's a great dude, too. A shift put on for Cooney on the right side of the plate as he fouls this one off into the netting. Second baseman to Carlo, almost behind the bag at second, but now with two strikes, he's going to move closer to his normal position. And I say that as a Mount Hood Saint, talking about, yeah, a, red, yeah. talking about a red devil. So. <laughs> Both of you guys in the NWAC? The one, two, flared out in the right field. Coming in is Morales. He will make the catch and holds on to it. 
Thought about throwing to first to double up Klemp, but Klemp was on his way back, so a fly out for Cooney results in the first out of the fourth inning for Portland. And that'll bring up Riley Knight, 0 for 1 today. He grounded out to the shortstop, Cam Clayton, his last time up. As Washington moves into the shift, Clayton, the shortstop, almost behind the bag at second. The third baseman, Snyder, off the line, almost 20 feet, it looks like. Heck, it might even be more. He almost looks like he's between second and third right now. And with a lefty on the mound, do you challenge Bunt? Do you think about it? 100% I'm on here if I'm Riley. Sends a fly ball near the gap. Morales over in that direction, getting underneath it. He'll make the catch. And there's two away now for the Pilots. So back-to-back -back fly outs into right field, and that'll bring up Spencer Scott, who struck out looking and is only at bat so far today. No, Briley's not in the lineup to bunt. You Correct, know that. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's got a power tool, and I think last year he was one of the, probably top three in home runs. I oh, think. he led the team in home yeah, runs. Yeah, led the team nine, in home yeah. runs. So to ask him to bunt uh, is ridiculous, especially with a guy in one out and one out, and it's a weird time to bunt. But I do, I, I do believe this. If they're going to play Briley Knight, the third baseman at shortstop when he hits, I would bunt until they quit doing it. Yeah. And, and just take his singles. Uh, for, uh, we already know that he can really run. Uh, so he doesn't even have to do a great bunt, and especially with the left-hander on the mound as well. That's the reason why I asked that. It would have been extra difficult for them with the lefty on the mound and the third baseman playing off the line. You put that in a nice spot. It's an easy single for him. Well, I'm a big believer just getting it on the chart. I mean, this has been a great game to get it on the chart. You know, Briley bunt it, you know, Briley bunt it, will bunt, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and you get that on the chart, and then you have to kind of play that shift a little different than they're playing him. You have to be a bit more honest with that shift. As Scott fouls it off, he's now behind one and two in the count. And then you're playing to win the game, and uh, yeah, I just, you know, it's something that uh, over the years, and, and again, I don't coach at this level, so I can't speak to how they, the, there might be some unwritten rules, so you just don't do that, but <laughs> But at the end of the day, you know, I've taught guys to actually stare down the third baseman and act like we're going to bunt just to get him the corners to come in so we can get a little bit more angles to get hits. So uh, Boyle throws over to first. Doesn't hurt your batting average either, right? No. In the book, it would say single. Single. And, you know, the thing about where they're playing him, too, you know, it could turn into a snowball fight, too, because the guy might come up and think he can field it and still get him out and throw it into right field, and everybody's safe. And, it, you know, I think we've talked about this a little bit before, but, like, Riku Nishida from Mount Hood Community College that's at Oregon right now, he bunted in some weird situations like this, and because of they were out of position, it turned into snowball fights. What I mean by that is they throw the ball away. Yeah. <laughs> Inside on Scott, even as the count of two and two. Throw over to first, almost got Clamp. He was leaning towards second, but he just got back in there safely. Well, no doubt he can run a little bit. No doubt they're going to try to get him to second base so they can, if you do get a hit here, he'll, they'll get a run. It's two and two on Scott. Scott is looking for his first hit since Saturday afternoon in game two of the doubleheader against Utah Valley. He fouls off another one, two and two count. Now I'll tell you that uh, Sam hasn't used a breaking ball very much. Now I'm not saying he's going to use it here, but at some point you're going to see it. Mm -hmm. It's been a lot of fastball, a lot of change, fastball in, fastball up, fastball away, change down and away, and a few change in. Scott lifts this one out in the left field. A.J. Guerrero takes his drop step, and he comes in, and he'll make that catch. And the Pilots strand the leadoff walk. Three straight flyouts to end the fourth inning. As we head to the fifth, coming to the plate for the Huskies, it's going to be Will Simpson, Johnny Tincher, and Kobe Morales when we return on the WCC Network.
There's a look at Jason Kelly. He snuck back in. Yeah, the dugout he did. He did sneak back into the dugout right there. The first year head coach for the Washington Huskies has this team out to a nine and two record as Will Simpson crushes a ball into left and Briley Knight watches that one sail right into the trees. And a solo home run for the Huskies to start off the fifth inning. Yeah, he just hand bushed the first pitch and it was a little bit elevated and uh, I'll tell you right now, when I was down there watching him take BP, he is not a small person. <laughs> he's a no, big, he's not. He's a big physical person, and like I said, the ball got elevated a little bit, and he was in straight ambush mode, and, and he got it. 6'4", 225, as he hits a team-high fifth home run on the season and gives the Huskies a 3-0 lead. Well, the good news is bases are now empty to reset everything now for Saunders. Tincher stepping to the plate, takes a first pitch strike. Tincher's hitting 349 on the year, 15 hits, four home runs, 13 RBI. Tincher standing at 5'8 with the four home runs. Here's a chopper right back up the middle, played behind the bag by Pataxel, and he'll eat it. Tincher ran a hard 90, would have been difficult over at first, and it's an infield single. Kobe Morales now comes to the plate. Morales is one for one, had a single back in the fourth where he came around to score thanks to an RBI single by Michael Snyder. The other time he was up at the plate, he walked back in the first inning. Saunders missing off the far side of the plate to start off this at bat, 1-0. Decent lead over at first right now for Tincher. Tincher only has one stolen base on three attempts so far this season. Good lead off for him again over at first. Saunders doesn't like it, throws it over. No tag by Tolia. Back to the 1-1. Morales, a lot of air on that swing, one and two. Huskies have won seven of the last 10 matchups between these two teams, but the Pilots have taken two of the last five. Most recently last year, almost exactly a year ago up in Seattle, the Pilots won five to four. As Saunders missing that one. That's now two and two. This marks the sixth straight season that these two teams are playing against each other. Pilots will finish up this set with the Huskies later on this month on the 28th when they go up to Seattle. And that'll be the end of the two games that these two teams play this season as Morales fouls it off and out of the glove of Clem, two and two. Saunders trying to get the first out here in this inning. Morales puts one back into center field. Holcroft going back towards the warning track. Gets behind it in time. And they're going to try to tag up and go to second. Pataxel gets the ball. And Tincher taking advantage of the deep fly ball into center field. Tags up and moves 90 feet up to second base. Good piece of base running right there, uh, realizing that the ball was going to be all the way to the wall. It's either going to get caught at the wall. You can see right off the bat, he realizes that it's going to be caught at the wall, and, and just he just knows that the stopwatch, he can win that stopwatch game. It's going to be very difficult to make a catch against the wall, set our feet and make a throw, and gets to scoring position with one out. A.J. Guerrero at the plate, fouls off that first pitch of this at bat, 0-1. We'll see if the Huskies can take advantage of the fact that they have a man now in scoring position. It's not often you see somebody tag up from first to move up to second. Yeah, there's some lines on the field and some depths on the field that if you've got a rabbit on first base that you can do some things. You know, the standard thing is to follow that ball out. 
uh, follow that ball out as it goes and go as far as the ball allows you to go and then go back. But he recognized really early that that ball was hit pretty hard and there's a pretty good chance that it's either going to be out off the wall or caught at the wall. So he goes back and gets that extra 90 feet, which is, which is huge in the situation for them. Takes away the double play, puts a runner in scoring position. It's an advanced play, no doubt. Saunders looking back at Tincher. He'll come home with it. Breaking ball, pulled foul, and actually bounces its way into the dugout of the Pilots. 0-2 now on Guerrero. Well, Hebert's official stats on the day went three and a third on 65 pitches, giving up four hits, two earned runs, two strikeouts, and two walks. For the freshman from Anchorage, Alaska, I'd say pretty good start. First one of his career for the Pilots. Yo, 2 Guerrero puts this one into right field. Fielded by Mench on his glove side. Comes up throwing to Tolia, and that'll stop Tincher at third. And now there's runners on the corners with one out. And that brings up Michael Snyder, who's one for two today with an RBI single already. Snyder had that bloop single into shallow center field when the infield was drawn in. Yeah. Yeah, Hebert had a little bit of unluck, too. You know, uh, I thought he pitched pretty good for his first start, yeah. and in a freshman, he had that unlucky play. You know, I think the pilots were really smart to bring the infield in with the two strikes, and, you know, he just hit it where they weren't. It was kind of an unfair deal for him, but uh, he's going to be a great arm here on the bluff, no doubt. Slider from Saunders in there for a strike. Owned one. Could be a nice gem found by the pilots up in Alaska as when his career comes to an end. But a long way for that. It was only start one today. Saunders missing high and away. One and one. Sun is peeking through the clouds here at Joe Edsel Field. We are dealing with some overcast skies for the most part. You see the sun in the outfield grass right now. It's nice. We haven't seen a lot of sunshine here in the first part of this home stretch of the season for the Pilots as Saunders plunks Snyder. And now the bases are loaded for the Huskies again for the third time in five innings. So Tincher on third, moving up to second is Guerrero after his single, then Snyder with the hit by pitch. Michael Brown at the plate, he's 0 for 1 with a fly out to Briley Knight. His last time up though, he walked, which loaded up the bases. Takes a first pitch ball, 1-0. No arms warming up the bullpen right now for Portland. So this looks like Saunders inning to close. And of course, as I say that, a man comes out of the hitting facility for Portland. Saunders missing low and away to Brown, 2-0. And, oh. and it looks like a lefty. And that's Ryan Rembiz already warming up for Portland. Lefty arm. Brown, no chase on a fastball away, belt high, 3-0 now. And Saunders, ball away from walking in a run. See Rembiz warming up right there. Strike called on Brown. Makes the count, 3-1. Yeah, you really want to force action here. I know that, uh, you know, this is a big hitter and stuff, but you want to force action here. It's a midweek game. You want to attack the strike zone, and hopefully you get what you have here, which is, looks like maybe one run. Riley will, Riley will probably go to third base on this to keep the guy from going to third, which is what exactly what he did, and uh, minimizing damage is the important thing there. It's almost like you've coached this game before as one run comes in. It's now 4 nothing in favor of Washington as Tincher tags up on the sacrifice fly. Yeah, the whole key is just minimizing the damage. Uh, uh, you know, you get out of this inning with only one. You, uh, the Pilots have a great offensive lineup. 
you still have a chance to win the game. You can't, just can't let it turn into uh, get bigger than what it really is. And so great job by Saunders getting back in the strike zone and getting that uh, sack fly. Sam DeCarlo at the plate. He has struck out and he has walked. That walk brought in a run, so one RBI for him as he takes a first pitch strike, 0-1. Oh Again, 12 hits on the season for DeCarlo. Six of them have gone for extra bases. Saunders with his step off there. In the dirt, blocked by Klemp, one and one. Such a benefit to have a veteran catcher like Klemp behind the plate, catching not only Saunders, who's somewhat new to being on the mound, but even the freshman arm and Hebert and the versatility to catch multiple people out of the bullpen. As DeCarlo fouls this one off in front of the dugout of Portland. Well, and I, I think he's really underrated as a catcher. I think there's a lot of guys that don't really ha really know how great he really is as a catcher. And, you know, again, the pilots have done a really good job coaching catchers. And then uh, we knew he was athletic. We knew he can handle the bat. And now he's really showing that he can catch the baseball. And, you know, he has a really good chance to, to play at the next level. The one-two from Saunders. DeCarlo spoils it. Foul out to our right. And if you don't know a lot about baseball and you're interested in how good a player is, you just got to scout the scouts. And every time he gets up to bat, there's a bunch of cameras going. And, you, you know, that's the player that you should say, yeah, I think this guy's going to be pretty good. You look, <laughs> you look pretty smart when you, when you scout the scouts, you know. Just got to know how to find them out in the stands. You'll see them. The one-two from Saunders. Blocked by Klemp in the chest. Two and two now to DiCarlo. Just look for the uh, the old salty guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Actually, uh, there's been a little bit of turnover here in the Northwest. Uh, I got a chance to reacquaint myself with uh, with the new Cubs guy from oh, the yeah. era. Yeah, I know. I knew you'd like that because oh, you're yeah. a Chicago guy, and and it's a. Uh, well, we're uh, in a rebuilding time right now too. Yeah, it's a young fellow named uh, Steve Ames, uh, kind of a big time name over in Vancouver. DeCarlo goes down with a strikeout, and that will end the inning for the Huskies. Two runs come in to score thanks to a solo home run and a sacrifice fly. We head to the bottom of the fifth. Two up for the Pilots, Mench, Pataxel, and Tolia on the WCC Network.
Welcome back to Joe Edso Field. Bottom of the fifth inning. The Pilots trailing 4 0 to the Huskies. New arm on the mound for Washington. It's Grant Cunningham as he makes his third appearance on the season. Has a 2.84 ERA, an 0 1 record. Through six and a third innings of work, he's given up five hits, two earned runs, six strikeouts, and three walks. As Henry Mench fouls off the first pitch he sees, all air over there by the cars, makes it 0 1. Sam Boyle had a great outing in his first start. Four innings of work, 54 pitches, only giving up one hit, five strikeouts, and one walk as Mench takes a ball there to even the count at one and one. Mench today 0 for 1, strikeout swinging back in the second. As he falls behind, 1 and 2 in the count to Cunningham. Cunningham, a freshman from Seattle Prep, went from Seattle, Washington. Mench over towards second and past the diving glove of DiCarlo. And the Pilots have just their second hit in today's game, and the leadoff man is aboard. There's a lot of movement on the pitches from Boyle. And maybe with him out off the mound now, the Pilots can get some life going on the bases and score some runs as Ben Pataxel comes to the plate. Owen one on the day with a fly ball into center field that was caught by McKay Barney. Yeah, Sam's got a little Bugs Bunny in his pitches, doesn't he? There's a hard, it looks, it looks like it here, but it's really here, and it's uh, very difficult. Yeah, don't envy the hitters. I had to go up against that today. As Pataxel starts out with a 1-0 and count. Pull side shift right now for Pataxel. DeCarlo almost behind the bag at second right now. That's the second baseman for Washington as Pataxel takes a strike one and one. And we're seeing a lot of that defense specifically in this game today. We're used to seeing it against Briley Knight, but we've seen it against a couple of right-handed bats as well. I believe they did it against Christian Cooney earlier. The one one, no chase from Pataxel makes it two and one. Yeah, they're, they're privy to information and I'm sure Pataxel's uh, spray chart looks a lot like the way the guys are standing right now. Mm -hmm. So they're going to gamble that the uh, spray chart is, you know, a good indicator of the future is the past. And that's why they got him there. 2-1, fouled off to our right across the street. We'll go back to the 2-2, Mench back over to first. Mench 0 for 1 on stolen base attempts this season. Only playing in his seventh game. Pataxel playing in his tenth. Five hits on the season. Batting 200 with one double and one RBI. The 2-2. Yeah. Fouled off and out of the glove of Tincher. Secondary for Mench, high chopper over to second, or over to the left side, excuse me, taken by Snyder and Pataxel thrown out over at first. Mench moves up to second, though, on the fielder's choice. Zach Tolia coming to the plate. Last play by Snyder. Man, Mench was already at second by the time he was ready to throw the ball over to first. So now the Pilots have a man in scoring position. They have not been in this spot since the first inning when Jake Holcroft started the, the Pilots' half of the first inning off with a leadoff triple. Tolia off the end of the bat. Goes down the first baseline and foul. He starts out 0-1. Now over the weekend, you and I had a little bit of a friendly wager on... Uh, we picked two players on who was going to hit the first home a home run. And if I remember correctly, I had Pataxel and Cooney, and you had Knight, and I can't remember who the other guy was. Do you remember? I don't. I want to say it was Clemp, but that doesn't sound right. It was Clemp. You went with the obvious one. You went with the chalk. I remember now. <laughs> chalk would be Holcroft, though, I you think. Here's the 1-1. <laughs> Talia puts one into the gap in left center field. 
Mench rounds third. He's going to score easily to Leah over at second. And it's a stand-up RBI double for the Portland Pilots and Zach Talia, and they get their first run on the board. Yeah, great piece of hitting there by Talia. Just took a pitch, hit it where it was at, found the left center gap. You see that party going on in the dugout after they score. Yeah, great piece of hitting. Looked inside near the knees and put it right into the gap in the left center field. And now we're going to have a pinch hitter in the game. Jonas Salk's day is done. He struck out looking in his only at bat, and now it's going to be Jake Sukata, the normal everyday infielder for the Pilots, steps to the plate. Yeah, Coach Luma starting to roll the left-handers in. You know, he didn't have Sukata in against Sam, and and now he's uh, now he's putting uh, Sukata in against the right-hander. After Sukata goes back to the top of the lineup to Holcroft. Sukata lays off the high pitch away, 1-0. On the season, Sukata's hitting 294 through 11 games. He's got 10 hits and 34 at bats. He's driven in five. Has a chance to drive in his sixth run of the year with a base hit. Good placement on that pitch. Called a strike on Sukata. He thought about it. Didn't pull the trigger. One and one. Clayton, the shortstop, playing behind the bag at second. The 1-1. One, one. Sukata inside near the feet. Called the ball 2-1. and one. <laughs> Snyder, the third baseman, about 10 feet off the line. Maybe a little more. As Sukata tries to turn on an inside pitch, fouls it to the backstop. 2-2. Two and two. You know, midweek game, uh, right-handers versus the left-hander, and then you're switching over. Good chance we could maybe see Ethan Loveless out yeah. and, uh, out for Mench at some point. You're right. Loveless uh, came in and ran the bases uh, well this weekend for the Pilots. And two separate times. Here's the 2-2 to Sukata. Hit over to the left side, and right where the shortstop normally would be. Tolia moving up to third, and Sukata has himself a single. So the shift didn't work out for Washington right there. Sukata looked like he took a pitch that was outside and just hit it where it was. Yeah, interesting interesting baseball play there. And I'm going to tell you why it's interesting. So the third baseman in that situation, the ball squeaks betwe between the shifted uh, infielders. And his first reaction is to come cut home. But when he cut home, he vacated third base. And had he not vacated third base, He'd still, the runner, the pilot's runner still be at second base. So kind of an interesting baseball play. Holcroft skies this one out into left. Guerrero towards the line. Now he stops. He makes the catch. Tagging up is Tolia from third. And it'll be a sack fly for Jake Holcroft. And the pilots get their second run across. Yeah, great baseball right there. Uh, Holcroft not, uh, you know, you don't have to do too much. You know, you get a guy over there at third base with less than two outs, 13 ways to score. He gets a pitch. He drives it far enough that... They can uh, get that run, and the Pilots tie the inning and, and, and take that inning. That could have been a disaster. They minimize, and now they're in the ball game. You think that actually goes back to that third baseman, Snyder, vacating third, allowing Talia to tag up right there. Otherwise, he's not at third. He's at second. Yeah, and it's a little bit of victim of the game because his reaction is to go cut the baseball because he might score. Uh, but that's why you, know, you kind of need to use all your senses in that situation. Uh, he was running to get in a cut position. You could see that the Talia wasn't coming and maybe just going uh, back to third. Had he not moved at all, just let's pretend he did not move at all, then Talia would have stayed at second base. But, uh, yeah, that was an interesting play there. Well, the Pilots, they were held to just one hit while Boyle was in the game. Here in the fifth inning, they have three hits so far and two runs. And that, uh, that's the evening out of the baseball gods because the infield came in and the little <laughs> bloop single, you know, the ball to the outfield that sneaks through, he comes to cut it, and, then, and they're even it out. Yep. What's the saying? Water always finds its level. The 2-0 to Klemp. 
Fouls this one back behind home plate. Tincher will follow it, but it goes beyond the netting. For a strike, and it's two and one now on Clem. Clem came into today hitting 500, 23 hits and 46 at-bats with 10 RBI, two home runs and 16 runs scored. Started out scorching hot at Utah Valley, continued that against Texas A&M, and then ran into Utah Valley, who slowed him down just a bit, but still productive at the plate. The 2-1 popped up, shallow on the first base side. Simpson's called off by DeCarlo, the second baseman, and he makes the catch in foul territory. He had to run a long way to make that one, but the Pilots, Score two, they even up the fifth inning, but they still trail four to two as we head to the sixth. It's the bottom of the lineup. McKay, Barney, Cam Clayton, and Will Simpson come to the plate next for Washington. Welcome back to Joe Enzo Field. Top of the sixth inning, the Pilots are trailing 4-2 to two to the Washington Huskies. Ryan Rembiz is the new man on the mound for the Pilots so far this year. He's 1-0 through four appearances with a 3-3-8 ERA. Eight innings of work. He's given up seven hits, three earned runs, nine strikeouts to four walks. Now, we saw him against Utah Valley, Corey. We've seen that he can be effective, but had a little bit of a hiccup against the Wolverines. Well, the big thing for Rembez is he's got to land the breaking ball. It's a, you know, he's a fastball, break the ball guy, and with the velocity that he has, which he's going to work 85 to 87 from the left side, it's very important that he lands the big breaking ball. And it's a good breaking ball. Christian Dicochea steps to the plate as a pinch hitter for McKay Barney. Dicochea hitting 333 this year through seven games. So he takes a first pitch strike from Rembiz. Six hits and one RBI. Dicochea has played in 52 games coming into this season, hitting 248 over his career. He did hit 310 in 21 games last season, and if you're wondering if you've heard the name Dicochea before, that's uh, because his brother Jason also played at Santa Clara in the West Coast Conference. So two and one on Dicochea. Saunders finished the day one and two-thirds inning work on 47 pitches. Three hits, two earned runs, three strikeouts, and one walk, one hit batter as Dicoche takes ball three, three and one. Inside on Dicoche and called a strike. He thought it was ball four. Full count now. Infield playing back for Portland. Out of play to our right. We'll reset on the full count. Go, 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 
No changes defensively for Portland except for Sukata now at second for Salk. So it's Knight, Holcroft, and Mench in the outfield. Strikeout for DiCochea. And the first out is recorded here in the six as we now bring up Cam Clayton. The rest of the infield, though, Spencer Scott and Ben Patax on the left side. Sukata, who just came in as a pinch hitter for Jonas Salk, now at second, and Tolia over at first. And it looked like Rembiz right there just powered through with a fastball elevated. Yeah, and had a little bit of run on it and got away from his bat. There's a breaking ball, looks pretty good. Called a ball though, 1-0 to start off Clayton. Yeah, very important that that lands. Now, I don't know if that was high or not, but it was high for, high for Todd. And, and uh, you know, you want to get ahead of these hitters. Clayton so far today, 0 for 3. Did reach on an error. There's a breaking ball that stayed high and away, 2-0. Flew out to left field back in the third, and then he struck out in the fourth. Fouled off to our right. Across the street. That'll make it two and one now on Clayton. Clayton last year end of the season on a nine game hitting streak. And coming into this year, actually the first couple of games as of March 1st, he was on a 16 game hitting streak. Fly ball hit into left field. Briley Knight not too worried about it. Strolls over to his left, makes the catch. And there's two away now for the Huskies in the sixth. Prime example, we talked about it there. He threw a 2-2 breaking ball, and he went early on it, got a pop-up. And, and like I said, if he lands his breaking ball, he's going to be very, very effective. And Rembes has come a long ways. You know, he used to be a little skinny cat, and he's, he's definitely uh, put good weight on and, uh, and looks pretty physical out there. Will Simpson takes a pitch low and inside for a ball, starting out 1-0. and Simpson patiently waits, now 2-0, and after a similar pitch from Rembiz. Simpson turns on one down the third baseline. Foul, though. His first strike. It'll be two and one. <laughs> Rembiz missing inside to Simpson. That'll make it three and one. Simpson's two for three today. A single back in the first and a solo home run to start off the fifth inning. Otherwise, he struck out back in the third. Big power bat. Monster home run into left that Knight just had to watch go into the trees. 3-1, fouled off, full count now. 3-2. Infield playing back for Portland. Tincher on deck, the catcher for the Huskies. Breaking ball, ball four to Simpson. And so with two outs, they walk him on. And that'll bring up Johnny Tincher, who's one for three today. Infield fly rule back in the first, grounded out to third back in the fourth, and then he had a single back in the fifth when he came around and scored on a sacrifice fly by Michael Brown. First pitch to Tincher inside, breaking ball. Ends up near the feet, 1-0. and Well, Corey, pretty important fact about baseball happened on this date. Back in the 1800s, they were still breaking out all the rules for this game. In fact, on this date, in 1857, the New York Knickerbocker Ball club, along with 16 other clubs, came together to make the official rules for Major League Baseball. 
as Tincher hits a ground ball over to short into left field. Knight will take it, and no, goes off the heel of his glove. Simpson will stay at second, though, and it's a two-out single, two runners on. Now, they voted to make it nine innings as an official baseball game. Do you know what constituted an official baseball game before the nine innings? I'm going to guess double that, 18. 18 innings. That's a lot of innings as Kobe Morales steps to the plate today. Morales is one for two with a single walk, and then he also flew out to Holcroft his last time up. Remba is delivering a strike, 0-1. You'd be wrong on that one. They actually played to 21 aces or 21 runs uh, that they used to call aces. Now, when they were coming up with these strict rules and what constitutes a full game, the 0-1 to Morales in the dirt blocked by Clem makes it one and one. Those games usually lasted about only six innings, so originally they wanted to only do seven because they thought that would be a full game. Now, they're... It was lost in translation, and nobody actually wrote down why they decided to go with nine innings. But that's what they ended up deciding on. And originally, everybody was against it as a ground ball hit into right center field. Simpson's going to round third. Tincher round second. He's going to head towards third. And that's an RBI single for Kobe Morales. So they'd get 21 runs. Are you talking 21 combined? Or are you talking 21 21 total? for one team. My goodness. But those, it only lasted about two and a half hours, six innings. So when they suggested nine innings, they thought that's 50% longer for a normal game. How could you make that a complete game? But eventually everything just fell into line. Let's just say it probably wasn't a pitcher's game back then. No, it was not. Uh, and one of the reasons why they didn't want to have those nine-inning games is half the games in 1856 anyways were suspended because of darkness through six innings and those 21 runs that they were already trying to get to. If we had to get to 21 runs, you'd be awful ornery as a broadcaster. <laughs> I've been with you on a one. <laughs> You've been with me on some 15-inning games, 21-run uh, games. I think the longest game we ever did was probably about, I want to say 16 innings, and I'll never forget. You told me when you walked in the park you didn't have anything to eat today, and then we had a <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Just uh, mixing a little hangry with, uh, you know, why can't we end this game? If I remember correctly, there were multiple opportunities for it to be concluded early on, and they couldn't get the timely hit. And you were getting angry about it. But my, favorite, <laughs> my favorite part was that you were so calm on air and so nice on air. And then the minute we went off air, you were just mad. The 0-2. Guerrero spoils this one. We'll go back to the 0-2 with two outs. No, I remember that one. It's They're always just kids, you know. Yeah. <laughs> It's always the, the day that you didn't eat lunch and didn't Yep, that's prepare, when they get you. Prepare properly. Breaking ball stays high on Guerrero, makes it one and two. Thinking back to 21 runs, I think we've only called one game that has been 21 runs for Portland. Believe it or not, a breaking ball on Guerrero will end this inning, though. One run comes in to score thanks to an RBI single by Kobe Morales. And they tack on to that lead. It's now 5-2 to two in favor of the Huskies. We head to the bottom of the sixth. Christian Cooney, Briley Knight, and Spencer Scott all due up on the WCC Network.
Welcome back to Joe Enzo Field. Christian Cooney leads things off for the Pilots in the bottom of the sixth inning. Brian Slyke and Corey Keir with your call as Grant Cunningham, Cunningham excuse me, comes out for his second inning of work. Cooney fouls off the first pitch he sees for a strike 0-1. Luke Roeder is now in center field for the Huskies. That is the only change defensively for Washington. Cooney, ground ball, and a diving play by Snyder over at third, comes up throwing, and they get Cooney over at first. Wow, that's a big, big, big league play right there. Fantastic play over at third by Michael Snyder to rob Christian Cooney of a hit down the line. Take another look. Just a step and a dive and then regains his feet and, and just throws a missile across the diamond. That's the difference between Division I baseball and junior college baseball yeah. is there's no guy in my team that can do that, that's for <laughs> sure. We're gonna long we're gonna three hop it across the field. We might get the out, but not against Christian Cooney, who can really run. Brian Knight at the plate, he's 0 for 2 today. Ground out and a fly out in his two at bats. Skies one out into right field. Morales, though, just in front of the warning track, stops, plants himself, and makes the catch on night two away. So uh, you did a trivia question earlier, and I, and, I, and I won, and I got a point. I got a trivia question for you, and it has to do with the most runs the Pilots have scored uh, in a game since we've been together. Since we've been together. Yeah, I'll even just go right back to last year. Last year, biggest game of the year, most runs scored. Do you remember it? It, something special happened in that game besides the amount of runs. Is it the 21-11 game against St. Mary's? 22-12. to 22-12, yeah. okay. Yeah, and do you remember what was special about that game? And Scott takes a strike there, falling behind 0-2. I don't. Okay, let's just say the day before you and I had a conversation about someone hitting their first home run. He hit two balls oh, off the wall yeah. the day before. <laughs> you know, Nick Klemp hit his home run. Hit his first home run of the year, May 15th. He went four for six that day and hit his first home run. And the unfortunate thing is... You weren't even in the booth for I it. I wasn't in the booth. We, we actually did that in the morning. We did a game in the morning, and we talked about how he was going to get his first home run. He hit two balls off the wall. And then he finally got the best of one and hit it over the wall in left center field as Scott rounds out over to first. And it's a 1-2-3 inning for the Pilots. As we head to the seventh inning, coming to the plate for the Huskies, Michael Snyder, Michael Brown, and Sam DeCarlo. All due up on the WCC Network.
Welcome back onto the campus of the University of Portland. Brian Slack and Corey Keir with your call. As the Pilots trail 5-2 to two to the Washington Huskies, Jack Fulkins now steps on the rubbers. He's making his fifth appearance on the season through eight innings of work, has a 1-1 one one record, a 1-1-3 one one ERA, 10 strikeouts to just four walks. First man he's going to go up against is Michael Snyder, who just made a dandy of a play over at third to get Christian Cooney out to start off the bottom of the sixth inning. Fulkins breaking ball inside. Can't find the zone, though. It'll be one and one. Now, before we left, you were talking about the 22-run game that the Pilots had against St. Mary's in which they had 14 runs in the second inning against the Gales as Klemp stops that one. It'll be two and one on the count. And I stand corrected. I actually started the game with you. You did start the game with me, but it was a Sunday, and uh, I believe you had to leave you had a prior uh, engagement you had to get to yeah the boss wanted me to be in church okay well you can't go against the boss's wishes right there breaking ball from Fulkins falls in for a strike two and two and I told her that there was a 14 inning second inning but she didn't believe uh, me. <laughs> had to look at the scoreboard <laughs> yeah check the website and I fortunately still have that book right in front of me and I'm looking at this 14 run inning and I gave you some of that breakdown of, of what happened in that inning. Let them know about it. Yeah, five doubles, seven walks, one hit by pitch. And uh, the professional hitter Gabe Scoro had four RBI alone in that inning as Snyder works himself on with a full count walk. Yeah, had six RBIs that game. And uh, a shout out to uh, Gabe Scoro, one of my favorite all-time uh, players over the last few years, professional hitter. He did so much for the Pilots. He did. It was really fun. He, he'd come off the bench and he'd find a way to get a big hit and he'd swipe a bag and then he just did a lot for the pilots and uh, yeah. Now that's why we called him the professional hitter is because of his ability to come off the bench at any point in the game and it, it didn't matter if he got on via walk, he got hit or he got a hit. He just found a way to get on and be productive for the pilots. As Michael Brown comes to the plate. Yeah, had a great career here. Throw back over to first. Snyder back safely. Brown on the day is 0 for 1 with a fly out in the second. He walked in the fourth, was left stranded at second, and then he had a sacrifice fly back in the fifth inning. The 0 1 from Fulkins thought about swinging it, but left the bat on his shoulder, called the ball 1 and 1. Big swing from Brown. Breaking ball fools him one and two. Now, 22 runs with St. Mary's is pretty high. I want to say in our first season doing games together, in that 2020 season, there was a big one against Stephen F. Austin. They won 14 to one against Nevada, 13 to nothing. And then 17 to one against Stephen F. Austin. The one, two, Brown comes up empty on that one. Strikeout for Fulkins gets the first out here in the seventh and that'll bring up Sam DiCarlo, who's 0 for two today with an RBI walk back in the fourth to go along with two strikeouts. Carlo taking a ball above the letters, far side of the plate, 1 0. Yeah, I believe that 22 uh, run game is the, the most that we've called. DiCarlo puts a drive into one into the gap in right center field. Mench will get underneath it for the catch and the out, two away. Yeah, 17 uh, one on a Sunday as well, March 1st, uh, back in 2020 in the shortened season when the Pilots started out about as hot as you can start out. They were 12 and four overall, uh, and the COVID cut them short. 10 and one at home, lost one game at home. That was the season now that they were in Ridgefield and 
at Hillsborough Stadium because they were doing the renovations here at Joe Wetzel Field. Luke Rowder is up at the plate for his first at-bats. Rowder is in defensively for Christian Dicochea, who was pinch hitting for McKay Barney last time. Rowder takes the inside strike. That'll even count at one and one. Hitting 500 on the season, only his third at-bat though. Has five runs, two RBI. His one hit was a double. Called a strike. Now behind in the count, one and two. Fouled off by Rolder. We'll go back to the one-two count. Pilots hanging tough in this one, but trailing by three. It's a terrific start by Sam Boyle of Washington, limiting the Pilots to just one hit through the first four innings. Portland able to jump on Grant Cunningham for two runs in the bottom of the fifth. But it's been two runs in the fourth, two in the fifth so far. No runs in the seventh, and that'll end it. Runner left stranded on after the leadoff walk. Fulkins gets out of the inning as we head to the bottom of the seventh. Get up and stretch for the seventh inning stretch. Mench, Pataxel, and Tolia all coming to the plate next for the Portland Pilots. Henry Mensch leading things off for the Pilots here in the bottom of the seventh inning. He's one for two today with a single and a strikeout. He came around to score back in the fifth inning thanks to an RBI double by Zach Talia. As Grant Cunningham comes out for his third inning of work in relief of Sam Boyle. But a terrific outing in his first start for the Huskies. Five strikeouts, one walk through four innings of work and 54 pitches thrown. Mench lays down a bunt right in front of the pitcher. Cunningham fields it, and a low throw over to Simpson. Gets Mench in time. And the first down is recorded here in the seventh. And they had the defense playing back. I don't think Mench put that ball where he wanted because it went right back to the pitcher. Had he angled that more towards the line. Now batting the shortstop, number 11, Ben Petaxel. Not that late, only about a half step. Ben Pataxel now at the plate. He's 0 for 2 today, a fly out to center. And then his last time up, he grounded out to Michael Snyder. But here he gets plunked. First hit batter for Portland. So he will find his way over to first after the out. And Zach Tolia now comes to the plate. He's 1 for 2 today, strikeout in the third, and an RBI double back in the fifth.
With Roeder out in center for Washington, their outfield now looks like Guerrero, Roeder, and Morales from left to right. Their infield is Snyder, Clayton, DeCarlo, and Simpson with Tincher still behind the plate. And now you're going to see Ethan Loveless come into the game for Ben Pataxel. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. Now running at first base for the Pilots, number one, Ethan Loveless. And this is all about getting some speed on the base path. Hopefully you get him up to second into scoring position. And now we're going to have a mound visit from Coach Kelly. And uh, not seeing anybody up in the bullpen right now, but it's hard to tell from the angle that we are at. But it seems like Coach Kelly's just talking about trying to get out of this inning the way that his demeanor is on the mound. It doesn't look like he's going to take the ball away from him. As you see right now warming up is Josh Emanuels for Washington. And so Kelly will go back to the dugout. No pitching change. And Cunningham will get the okay to at least try to finish this inning, maybe at least get through this batter. Talia is the one who got that RBI double off of Cunningham to get the first run across for Portland. Yeah, a couple things from that mound visit that maybe I get from it. Number one is he might be given, uh, give him some time to get down there and get started. And also just to remind him that, you know, there's only so many outs left in this ball game, nine outs. And not that they're in the outs game yet, but the most important thing is recording outs at the plate. Uh, and that's probably what he came out and told him. He's got, we got a three run lead. Uh, you know, let's make sure we hold the runner to keep the double play in order, but understand the most important thing is the guy at the plate. Talia came into today hitting 333, five hits and 15 at bats. And he picked up his first RBI though on that RBI double. Loveless, decent lead off the bag at first. Cunningham peeks over his shoulder. He'll come home with it to Leah. Lays off the pitch near the knees. First strike, one and one. In between the innings, I went back to just to look what 19 looked like. I found two games where 20 runs was scored. And the interesting story about that is Gabe Scoro had a home run in one of them and had uh, three hits in the other one. Uh, saw that name Tamaro. Oh yeah, there. Trace Tamaro. Yeah. Trace Tamaro, and then and then the other thing that I completely forgot. You know, we've been talking a lot about the Columbia River kids, but Jace McKinney, who was a great Columbia River baseball player, played here at the Pilots. Uh, he had a, a triple in that game, and then three other hits. So it was a pretty, and that was against uh, San Diego, in San Diego, right? If I remember yep, correctly. Yep. So there's been some runs scored since uh, Coach Loomis's came. This one through the wickets of Tincher, so Loveless now in scoring position, moving up to second. It looks like Loveless is definitely going to be the rabbit off the bench <laughs> when they need it. The, anytime they need someone to run, he's the first one to go. And we know he can hit a little bit. We've seen it BP. And Talia gets hit. So back-to-back -back hit batters by Cunningham. And we're going to see Jake Sukata now come to the plate. I'm looking over in the Washington dugout to see if Coach Kelly's going to go out and make a pitching change. But he's actually out in front of the dugout giving the infield signal, signals, excuse me, for the left-handed batter, Sukata. Yeah, here he comes. And there now you're going to see the pitching change. So we're going to head to break. Cunningham's day is done. Emanuels is coming out of the bullpen for the Huskies. We'll be right back with his numbers on the WCC Network.
Welcome back to Joe Edsel Field. After the pitching change, Josh Emanuels is on the mound, making his sixth appearance for the Huskies this season. Through nine innings of work, he has a 1-0 record. No runs given up. Ten strikeouts and four walks on the season. As he goes up against Jake Sukata, inside, almost hits him. That would have been a third straight hit batter for Portland. Ethan Loveless is standing on second. He's pinch running for Ben Pataxel, who got hit. And Zach Tulia, who got hit, was over at first. And now it's Evan Scavato who's pinch running for him. Sukata takes a strike. That'll even account at one and one. Sukata thought about it, check swing. They appeal to the third base umpire who's almost behind the mound. He calls a ball, it's two and one. Or not a ball, but says that he doesn't go around. Now last time the Huskies got burned by Sukata with that shift that they have on, he went basically where the sh shortstop normally would be set up and got a single, but now he sits ahead on the count three and one. He definitely has the ability to hit it to all fields. And, you know, a couple years ago when he first broke into the lineup, he would hit balls down that left field yep. corner all day long. Inside fastball for a strike. Now a full count on Sukata, three and two. Sukata singled and is only at bat on the day. That was back in the fifth inning. The three, two, full count. Went towards third, ground ball to Snyder. Gets the out over at second. Sukata quickly down the line at first. Breaks up the double play. But he'll reach on a fielder's choice. Talia will be retired for the second out. And moving over to third is Ethan Loveless. And by Talia, I mean Scavato, who's pinch running for him. And that'll bring up Jake Holcroft. Good play by Snyder. I believe we ran into a play over the weekend where the third baseman ran over to the bag at third, which sort of broke up a double play opportunity. Holcroft takes ball one to start off this at bat, one and oh. But it gave his team an opportunity to get a double play right there, but Sukata just running a hard 90 and preventing that double play. Yeah, he didn't hit it hard enough, and so he had enough time to get there. Holcroft gets a fastball inside near the feet, 2-0. Oh. Holcroft is one for two on the day. Started the game off with a triple for Portland back in the first inning, then he grounded out to first. Last time up, he had a sacrifice fly that drove in Zach Talia. 3-0 oh count now on Holcroft. He's one of the more patient hitters in this lineup, knows the zone well. Inside for ball four, Holcroft gets on with a walk. So moving up to second is Sukata, and it's still Loveless over at third right now as Nick Klemp comes to the plate. And if you're a Pilot fan, this is probably the guy you want to have up there. He was hitting 500 coming into today. Now he's 0 for 2 with a pop out and a ground out. Otherwise, he walked back in the fourth to reach base. Yeah, it's exactly, you know, the pilots, you got your best guy of the year right now up, bases loaded, down three, chance to get a single or a double. That ball's well struck. It's dying out in center field, though, as it's caught by Roeder, and that will end the pilots' threat. They leave the bases loaded. No runs come in to score, and it remains a 5-2 game as we head to the eighth inning. It's the top of the lineup. Clayton, Simpson, and Tincher come to the plate for Washington on the WCC Network.
Welcome back to Joe Enzo Field. Top of the eighth inning. A new arm is on the mound for the Pilots. It's Carter Gaston, the freshman from Kelso, Washington. Delivers a first pitch strike to Cam Clayton to start him out 0-1. Gaston on the season has made two appearances, only got through a third of an inning, giving up four hits, three earned runs, three walks, no strikeouts. Ground ball up the middle, played by Sukata, throws across his body, and Clayton will be safe. Infield single. Great little play by Sukata there. Looked bang bang right there. First base umpire, Jim Courtney making the call. Yeah, Carter Gaston. Uh, here's another look at it. Oh boy. Well, I think he might have been out right there. It was close. It was close, yeah. It's hard to tell because you can't see the ball when it actually gets into the glove. From our angle, I thought it was a great call, but yeah. on, on replay, it was it was a lot closer than we thought it was. Now, remember that uh, Jim Courtney's right on top of it. He's a very experienced yep. umpire, yep. and we don't have the benefit of our ears. He, Correct. You, got, you, you use all your senses out there, and he can hear the pop, and he probably heard it late. Yeah, now we can see the bounce in, but we can't see actually when it reaches the glove Ooh. that's close man that is very close and then that's the question he's working through the ball does he secure the ball but Simpson pops this one up on the right side Mench the right fielder and uh, he didn't have a beat on it he lost it as it got above the lights in foul territory so Simpson will benefit from that for a strike it'll be one and two yeah when you when when you're six five they get a little bit higher than that <laughs> <laughs> that ball was way high Mench had a beat on it and then caught it late. Like I said, I think he lost it when it came back through the lights. Gaston up in Kelso, Washington was the 3A pitcher of the year. And Simpson lays off that fastball way two and two. Pitched 44 innings, had 51 strikeouts. And a uh, big thing about him is he was a 4.0 student. So a great student and one of the better arms that a uh, I mean, Kelso's always had a bunch of good arms come out of it. They've, they, got a, they got a couple big leaguers out of Kelso. Simpson goes down with a strikeout. Gaston gets his first strikeout as a Portland pilot. That'll take a little pressure off of him. I yep. mean, you get the close call, you get the ball in the lights, and now he'll now take a little pressure off him. Good delivery right there. Kept it low. As Tincher steps to the plate. Tincher is two for four. Back-to-back -back singles in his last two at-bats, and he came around to score back in the fifth inning thanks to a sacrifice fly by Michael Brown. There were some changes defensively for Portland. As this one's fouled off, I'll give them to you. Outfield has stayed the same. It's still Knight, Holcroft, and Mench from left to right, but the infield has changed. Scavato was pinch running for Zach Talia. Scavato now moves over to third. Spencer Scott, who was at third, is now at short. Sukata is at second. He came in for Salk a couple innings ago, and then Tristan Gomez is now over at first as Tincher drops down to a knee to foul this one off into the bullpen for Portland. Back to the 0-2 count. Tincher standing at just 5'8", 170 pounds, was the was an all-Pac-12 player and the defensive player of the year last season. Behind the plate, all-Pac-12 preseason coming into this season. The 0-2, ground ball back up the middle, bounces off the glove of Gaston. Sukata stays with it, and Tincher's thrown out. 1-4-3, just like they drew it up. Runner moves up to second. And that'll bring up Kobe Morales. Fantastic job, though, of Jake Sukata staying with the ball as it goes off of the glove of Gaston, who tried to field it. Morales steps to the plate. Two for three on the day. Two singles and a walk. Did score back in the fourth inning. Thanks to an RBI single by Michael Snyder. Has a chance to add an insurance run for the Huskies. Base hit might score the man on second and Cam Clayton. Go, 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 
Sukata in shallow right field. Scott keeping an eye on the runner at second. Gaston peeks back. Inside on Morales for a ball, 2-0. Two zero. Steps off the back of the rubber. Will reset. Morales swings through an off-speed pitch. Two and one. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Kelso High School's just had a ton of crazy. Good talent to uh, go through it over the years. You know, obviously big leaguer uh, Trevor May. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, many, many uh, college baseball players. And a famous country star, Cor Carpenter. He's on the all-time uh, doubles list uh, at Kelso High School. And he's a country music artist. Uh, Taylor Starr pitching the minor leagues. It's just... Tons and tons. There's something in the water up there in Kelso. <laughs> Here's the 2-2 two, two, two Morales. Strike three. Gaston gets the strikeout. He'll strand the runner over at second. Two Ks for, for Carter Gaston as we head to the bottom of the eighth inning. It's the middle of the lineup. Christian Cooney, Briley Knight, and Spencer Scott all coming to the dish next on the WCC Network. Bottom half of the eighth inning, the Pilots running out of outs here in this midweek matchup between the Washington Huskies and the Portland Pilots. Christian Cooney is the first man up going up against Manuels. It's 0-1 to start off for Cooney. Slider for a strike, belt high, far side of the plate, 0-2. Yeah, I forgot about Jason Schmidt. He played in the, uh, was a big leaguer, played in the uh, San Francisco organization. Just looking through their records. Their head coach up there is a heck of a head coach. I remember him pitching against us and uh, giving one of our arms at Columbia River the only loss of his uh, season. But the head coach up there now is Tyler Parsons, and he's doing a heck of a job. But yeah, no doubt that Kelso has some great tradition. It's nice to see the young man have some success on the mound. First pitch tonight, called a strike. 0 1 to start him off. I feel like the, the Northwest sort of gets overlooked for their baseball prowess. Everybody always talks about California and Texas, and, you know, they do have a right to talk a little bit down there, but there's awfully good baseball being played up here in both Washington and Oregon. That often gets overlooked. The 1-1 one -one tonight. Well, I'd say we're pretty fundamental. I mean, uh, you know, you think about how much 
baseball gets played in Arizona or Texas or Florida, and it's they draw a circle on the ground. If there's a raindrop, they don't play that day. <laughs> and here we draw a circle on the ground, and then and then we go inside and practice in the gym because it's raining every day. Uh, and well, we're really fortunate that uh, that as of late, uh, you know, AstroTurf has done a great job getting around the Northwest and getting all these ball fields all tidied up and uh, a, a lot more baseball being played outside in the rain. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing as a coach. Uh, I mean, there's some weather it's just not meant to be played in. And if you need three dozen baseballs and ten towels, I don't think it's a great time to play baseball. No, not at all. Briley Knight strikes out looking on a slider from Emanuels, and that will bring up a pinch hitter in Justin Sukata. He will be hitting for Spencer Scott. Okay, we have a second chance here for history. Yep, a couple yep. days ago, we had uh, both Sukatas get a hit in the game, and uh, pretty sure that uh, Jake Sukata's got a hit for on the day. A little, little, little he squiver went yeah, he went, field. Yeah, he went opposite field for his hit. Justin Sukata had a double against Utah Valley in his first appearance in a pilot uniform. Went off the wall. Well, there's still the dent in the fence out oh, yeah. there. <laughs> he, uh, you know, a young player trying to make a name for himself, hit the fence trying to catch a ball. Fouled off into the netting behind home plate. So quickly behind 0-2. Got a chance to talk to, to Jake uh, a couple days ago, and he's coming back to Richfield. I hit a lot of yep. fungos to him, and I was kind of hoping his brother was going to come, but I heard a rumor he's going off to the Bend Elks. Going to be down in Bend, Oregon, playing... Uh, down there. Well, you'll see a bunch of pilots just littered throughout the West Coast League. Here's the 0-2 with two outs. Slider stayed off the plate in the right-handed batter's box. One and two to Justin. Well, a large portion of them on this squad were a part of the championship Corvallis Knight yep. deal. Obviously, I believe Gartrell was a starter for the Knights. Briley and Holcroft and among others. Sukata goes down with a strikeout. And that will end this part of the eighth inning for the Pilots. As we head to the ninth, coming to the plate for the Huskies, it's Guerrero, Snyder, and Brown on the WCC Network. Welcome back to Joe Epsil Field. Ninth inning, final frame for these two teams as A.J. Guerrero steps to the box for the Huskies, who are leading 5-2. to two. Carter Gaston comes out for his second inning of work. Guerrero on the day is 2-4, for four, had a double in the fourth when he came around to score, thanks to an RBI walk. And then in the fifth inning, he singled and was left on second. And here in the ninth, he singles again, this time out. To left field, Briley Knight will field it quickly up throwing and a leadoff single for the Huskies. Third baseman, number 
New man out in the field at shortstop, Vinny Savione, freshman from Milwaukee, Oregon, with the Rex Putnam High School. What high school do you go to? Rex Putnam, excuse me. <laughs> I'm just giving you our No, time. no, no, no. I read it too fast. I was going to say, I didn't, I've never heard of Rex Putnam. <laughs> Sounded like you came from Canada. <laughs> Michael Snyder is up at the plate. Snyder is one for two today, but he has reached base three times. Singled in the fourth with an RBI, that little bloop shot that went off the glove of Pataxel when the infield was pulled in. Since then, though, he got hit by a pitch in the fifth and walked in the seventh. Over to third, played by Scavato, and his only play is over to first, and they will get the out on Snyder. Moving up to second is Guerrero, and there's one away. Man, I can't even believe the versatility of this team. It's ridiculous. You know, Scavato played four or five games in right field, and here he is on a midweek game uh, throwing the ball across the field at third base. Now, we saw him last year at third base, but, uh, uh, man, I'll tell you what, if you're going to play for the Pilots, you know, you might pitch, you might play third, you might play second, you might play right, and they just recruit baseball players is what it amounts to. You know, Brian, they talked about, uh, you know, this year we had that pitch clock thing going. And I will tell you that I've noticed since we've been in the booth that the pace of play is a lot faster. And we haven't had one uh, violation that I've seen. And maybe I missed it, but uh, I feel like uh, uh, everybody knows you got to speed up and they're doing it. Well, yeah, we had one ball call, but even that was reversed. And that happened in Sunday's game. Jeter Ibarra is the pinch hitter right now for Washington. But it seems like there's not really much need for the pitch clock, at least here at, at the Ets. I mean, these games, they're moving along at a, at a decent pace. I don't know if that's just how Portland likes to throw or they're doing that intentionally. Well, I think in general that college baseball is played at a quicker pace than professional baseball. I mean, uh, you know, keep in mind that... Uh, you know, these kids got to get back to the dorm and do yep. some homework. And, uh, and you know, the coaching staff has families. And, uh, you know, there's no fan. I mean, there's fans, but it's not like professional where it's just a big production. It's they're playing some baseball and, and getting out of here. So, but, yeah, it's the pitch clock uh, so far seems like a pretty good thing. Ibarra on the year has one hit and seven at-bats. He's hitting 143. But his one hit did bring in a run. This one in the ground. Clem keeps it in front of them, two and two. Yeah, that ball call, uh, you know, the Utah Valley team, they were one hopping. They would step off and they would throw a one hop to the fielder that they were throwing to. And uh, for some reason, the umpire thought it looked funny or something, called a balk, and then they went back together and talked, and it wasn't a balk. So he stepped off and threw it. So 2-2 two -two fouled off to our left. We'll reset with the even count. There is an arm warming up if this inning gets extended in any way. Number 43, Zach Johnson, a freshman, saw him pitch against Utah Valley. 2-2 off the end of the bat, down the first baseline, a dribbler into the first base coach's box will reset at the 2-2. Yeah, and he pitched well. Uh, showed a lot of makeup there. He's a young buck, a uh, freshman, true freshman. I want to say Westland High School. And uh, pitched with some makeup. Got through one inning of work in that seven-inning game two doubleheader against Utah Valley in which the Wolverines won one nothing. And the slider gets hit out into left field. Knight was going to come up, start throwing towards home. Scavato will take the cutoff throw. So Ibarra has himself a single with one out. And now there's runners on the corners. Ibarra is going to be pinch run for number nine, Dalton Chandler. Redshirt junior from Sammamish, Washington. Chandler's making his fourth appearance on the season.
No stolen bases on the year for him. Now batting the second baseman, number 51, Sam DiCarlo. Sam DiCarlo stepping to the plate for the fifth time today. Two strikeouts, a fly out, and a walk, which brought in a run. That was back in the fourth inning. Chandler quickly off the bag at first with a decent lead. DiCarlo takes a first pitch strike from Gaston. 0-1. Squaring the bunt to Carlo, Clemp fakes the throw. And so that will eliminate the double play with Chandler moving up to second. Now there's runners on second and third for DeCarlo. Roeder is on deck. He's got one at bat today where he struck out. That was in the seventh. Infield being pulled in for Portland. DeCarlo. Well struck ball out to right field. Mench dropping back. He will make the catch. One run will come in and score after tagging up. And there's an insurance run for the Huskies as Guerrero scores on the sacrifice fly. And it's now a 6-2 ball game in favor of Washington. Luke Rolder coming to the plate. Rolder with two RBI on the season. Could add another one here with a base hit. Breaking ball for a strike. Far side of the plate, 0-1. Gaston, you don't want to go back to the top of the lineup. You want to get out of this inning with this batter. Otherwise, Cam Clayton comes to the plate. Just off the plate and low. One and one now. Strike two called on Roeder. One and two. Portland does have a home series coming up against Niagara. It'll be this weekend, four games. One thing Friday I through Monday. I was going to say, one thing I noticed about that is it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, rather than Friday, double Saturday, single Sunday. A lot going on on the bluff this weekend with that series going on, along with the OSAA State Basketball Championships. Fly ball out in the left field. Knight comes in, a few steps, makes the catch, and that will end the Huskies' half of the ninth inning. One run comes into score thanks to the sacrifice fly by Sam DeCarlo as we head to the bottom of the ninth inning. The final three outs for the Pilots. Mench, Pataxel, and Scavato all coming to the plate next.
Case Matter now on the mound for the Huskies. Making his fifth appearance as a 1-0 record with a 1-1-2 ERA. Two saves already on the season. Eight innings of work, three hits, one earned run, 11 strikeouts to six walks, and he'll have to start off against Henry Mensch. First pitch that Mench sees ends up in the left-handed batter's box for a ball. He'll start out 1-0. Matter, a redshirt sophomore from Mill Creek, Washington. Mench skies this one into foul territory. Snyder, the third baseman, gets called off by the shortstop. And the catch will be made in foul territory by Cam Clayton. He had to run a long way to get there to call off his third baseman. But Mench is retired for the first out here in the ninth. Yeah, tough play there in the triangle. Uh, it's a, uh, you know, three guys converging, going down into that little area. and. Uh, Pretty good play for uh, not being the home field team, getting down there and, you know, the pilot's fence works at an angle and it goes from, you know, 35 feet down to about five feet or 10 feet down there on that line and a pretty darn good catch. Tristan Gomez steps to the plate for the first time today. He came in because Toledo was pinch run for by Evan Scavato. That's Gomez quickly behind 0 and 2. Gomez on the season hitting 333, eight hits and 24 at bats, two doubles, two home runs, and he's driven it in eight in the early part of the season. Yo the 2 goes down on strikes. Two away for the Pilots. They're down to their final out. And it'll be Evan Scavato. Scavato has not hit today. Came in as a pinch runner. But he's hitting 229 on the season with eight hits and 35 at bats. Does have a home run and eight RBI. The WCC All-Tournament player trying to pick up where he left off at the end of last season. The 1-0. Off the glove of Tincher. So Scavato will have a chance with a 2-0 count now. Scavato sitting pretty now, 3-0 in the count. Pilots have put up runs with two outs before. In fact, I'm pretty sure they put up a six spot against Texas A&M in the ninth inning with two outs. As Scavato works himself on with a four-pitch walk. So now Jake Sukata comes to the plate at the bottom of the lineup. One for two today, singled back in the fifth, and then reached on a fielder's choice back in the seventh. That shift put on. Clayton, the shortstop, almost behind the bag at second, the right side of the infield playing back. Sukata lays down a bunt, pops it up, and fortunate that nobody was able to get to it in foul territory. Sukata just looking for a way to get on. You know, in this situation, when you're down four and you're down to your last out, you're just trying not to be the last out of the game. And the goal is to get the, at least get the, the tying run to the plate. And if you just kind of look back, the tying runs clamp. And so you get clamped to the plate, you have a chance to, you know, possibly hit a ball out of the yard or hit a double off the wall and get back in this game. Here's the 0-1. Sukata lays off the high fastball. That'll even the count at one and one.
Sukata weighs off the inside pitch. That's low. Two and one now. Pilots having to face both of the better arms in the bullpen for Washington and Emanuels, and now you've got Matter, both of them with two saves on the season so far. Sukata takes a strike. Matter's working tonight, 91 to 92. I'm kind of peeking at some of the guns mm -hmm. over the edge here, and uh, uh, four or five scouts in the park tonight. And pretty heavy fastball. Looks like he throws a change up at about 84. A 2-2. High on Sukata. That one came in at 92. So full count now on Sukata. Pilots could use another base runner with Holcroft coming to the plate. 3-2, Scavato goes. Sukata fouls it off behind us. We'll go back to the 3-2. Nobody keeping an eye on Scavato, so he'll take off for second. And Sukata puts one into left field, and the left fielder in Guerrero will keep it in front of him. It's kind of that tweener ball. He could make a diving play, or he could keep it in front of him. It's kind of what we saw with Morales back in the first inning against Holcroft, where he went for the diving play, but it went over his glove into the fence for a triple, and Guerrero took the safe route right there and kept the ball in front of him. Yeah, the, the rule there is you either catch it or you block it you don't you don't go big dive and let it get to the fence and even though the Huskies are in the outs game right now they're really focused on the hitter not on the base runners uh, but again the pilots doing what you need to do in this situation is just don't be the last out and try to get the tying run to the plate Holcroft took an outside pitch and sends it out of play to our left he's behind 0-1 got to say Corey it felt like a broken record a lot of times in this game all these hitters keep starting off 0-1 yeah, one thing the pitching on both sides have done is 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 get a ball in the strike zone first uh, pitch of the at-bat, which has made the game fast. Folkroff takes inside and high for a ball, one and one. Klemp is on deck. Folkroft is one for two today. A walk and a sacrificed fly. He also had a triple to start off the game for the Pilots in the top of the first inning. Yeah, and both starters, true freshmen, yep. both of them, I'm going to tell you, started almost every hitter out. Now, I don't know the exact stats, but almost every hitter out with a strike. Uh, I know Boyle only had one walk, and I'm not sure that Hebert had a walk, but uh, or he did have two walks. But uh, I guarantee he started with a strike oh, because yeah. he did. He was very good at doing that. Uh, and both of them showed that they're the future of both clubs, most likely. Holcroft with the 2-2 count. Pilots down to their final out, final strike. And Holcroft, one hops it into right field. Scavato will be held up at third as Morales comes up throwing. It's cut off by Simpson, and now the bases are loaded. We talked about this, didn't we? Yes, we did you for Nick Klemp. You just keep fighting, you know, and that's what, uh, what good teams do, and, you know, no matter what happens here, uh, you want to the process of uh, uh, with these mid midweek games get extra guys at bats and then find a way to get that tying run to the plate. And you know, the next two guys both at any time can hit a ball out of the yard. So obviously, we're going to have a little conversation. Coach Kelly's going to go out and probably give some uh, words of advice to the young man on the mound, and uh, you know and. Klemp needs to do what the other guys did, which is just battle, 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 and find a way. You really don't want to, you really don't, I mean, a grand slam would be really cool. Like, but that's not, no. you don't want to start swinging for the fences when no, no. trying this, to keep this inning going. Yeah, in this situation, about three doubles in a row would be really fun. Uh, but uh, again, uh, there's no give up in the pilots. Pilots 2-2 two and two in the early home season after they split that series with Utah Valley this past weekend. Now, now Klemp is your guy, so if he hits a home run and ties the game, then you win the bet. But my guy's Cooney, so I'm hoping for a walk and then <laughs> yeah. a walk off, and then I win the bet. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But, uh, but a couple doubles in a row, like I said, would be pretty cool for the Pilots. 
Right. As Clem steps to the batter's box, looking for that first hit today. He's 0 for 3 with a walk. First pitch called a strike by the home plate umpire, Todd Ellis. Looks to be just below the letters, far side of the plate. Scavato, Sukata, and Holcroft are on the base path for Klimp. Jammed inside, but he fouls it off behind us. Or behind home plate, I should say, 0-2. Matter would love to get a K right here and get out of this jam. After walking Scavato and then back to back singles, Klemp fighting on an outside pitch that was called a strike just a few moments ago. Stays alive, 0 2. We really haven't seen but one, in my opinion, one secondary on Matty. He threw one changeup at about 84. It's been all fastballs. And that's it. Pilots lose this one 6-2 to two as Matter closes the door. A strikeout on Klemp. And the Pilots strand three runners on base. And that's all she wrote. 6-2 to two in favor of Washington in this midweek matchup. And, Corey, any final thoughts? on today's game. Well, I'll tell you, both starters on both sides pitched very well. The defense was was, was very good except for the first play of the game. And uh, the difference tonight was the offensive bats. The, the Huskies had a, uh, 12 hits and the Pilots had six, and that was really the difference today. But uh, two quality ball clubs that are gonna do really well in their divisions and uh, looking forward to seeing them down the road. Well, the Huskies extend their win streak to nine and the Pilots will have to regroup before their home series against Niagara. That was Corey Keir. Thank you to the production crew and everybody else that helps out. We love everything that you do for us. I'm Brian Slag. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time on the WCC Network.